I recently stumbled upon a little known story that I wanted to share, and I don't think more than a dozen people today have heard of it, and of that dozen I doubt anyone has really even thought about it. I only came across it by accident in an old wreck report that I found, I had never heard of it prior to this. It's the story of a wreck that occurred just beyond sight, but not beyond mind, and just within earshot of the New Jersey shore. The story of a crew that could have and should have all been saved, and the rescuers did everything right, but mistakes by the crew, probably in a panic, cost the lives of all on board the Barkentine Elmina. All that there is accounting for this tale, unless there's further evidence in a private collection somewhere that I'm not aware of, is the Coast Guard's annual report from 1884, which this video is based on. I did, however, find a couple of additional particulars about the vessel. There are no known images of her, but this is a somewhat similar ship. The Elmina was built in the William Date shipyard in England, near Devon, and first sailed in October 1874. She was registered out of Solcombe, England. I can't find records for 1884, the year she was lost, but as of three years prior, she was owned by a William Wakeham Steer. She was a barkentine of 247 tons, sailing north from Natal, Brazil to New York City with a cargo of sugar and a crew of eight. It's possible that it exists somewhere, but I was unable to find the names of her crew on her final voyage, aside from her captain, Captain Ball. As night fell on January 8, 1884, in Long Beach, New Jersey, a strong gale blew across the beach and rain poured down in torrents as the tide began to come in. Two brothers, Charles and Thomas Crane, had been walking along the beach to secure their skiff from the rising tide when they saw a flash of red light come out from across the darkness. The two Crane brothers, along with their father back home, were heavily involved in the life-saving station at Long Beach, and just by the distance and the motion of the red light, they were able to tell exactly what was happening. It was the port side navigation light of a ship, and given the distance, it was most certainly stuck on the sandbar about 200 yards offshore. The boys split up, one returning home to his father to inform him, and the other running to the Long Beach life-saving station to sound the alarm. Within only a few minutes, they had prepared a horse-drawn cart with a mortar used for shooting off lifelines to vessels in distress. In the raging surf, there was absolutely no way that they could get a rescue boat out to them, so firing a lifeline out to the ship was the best chance for survival. The team on duty, under the command of James Sprague, along with the Crane boys and their father, raced the three quarters of a mile south from the station to the point opposite the vessel. Between the dark, the storm, the cold, and the breaking waves in their face, visibility was low, but occasionally, between rain torrents, the crew could see that the ship in the distance was a barkentine, a three-masted sailing vessel with square rigging only on her foremast. They could see that the ship had now been pushed around and was facing the beach with her sails still set. She was described as looking like some large phantom, dark against a darker abyss. There was a light in her cabin that would give them something to aim for with the mortar. While they raced to set up the mortar, a red light was lit to signal to those on the ship that help was at hand, and the sound of a cheer carried across the crashing seas from the men on the ship, now climbing into its rigging. Mr. Crane was sent back to prepare a rescue boat, so that if the waves did let up enough, a boat was ready to go out at a moment's notice. The first shot from the mortar was fired, and it must have hit its mark perfectly, because when the men on the beach tugged on it, they felt it sawing across some part of the ship, but then it fell loose and had to be hauled back in the 200 yards by the men. A second, a third, and a fourth shot were fired, but none of those were successfully grabbed by those on the Elmina. By this time, the tide had risen dramatically. The normally 300 yard wide stretch of beach was now reduced to half, and the ship still appeared fast to the sandbar. Waves were seen crashing over her decks, and her men waved from the masts. She was down significantly in the bow, and she listed sharply to her starboard, rocking with each wave. 
Something was odd about her, though, that the men on the beach couldn't figure out. She sat there. Normally, when buffeted by waves, a ship like this is thrown ashore and torn apart. The ship is always a total loss, but rescuing her crew at that point is straightforward and often quite successful. Yet there was this phantom ship, holding to the bar and being dragged down with the tide. By now approaching midnight, patrols from the ship bottom life-saving station to the north and bond station in Beach Haven to the south came upon the scene and were sounding the alarm at their own posts as well. The tide continued to rise, forcing the rescuers to fall back further and further from the ship. They repositioned their mortar and fired a fifth shot, which was followed by a cheer from the men on the wreck, which meant two wonderful things. The shot had landed, and at least most of the crew were still alive. Now, the way the gun works is that it fires a projectile from a cannon with a rope attached to it. This rope is generally light, minimizing the drag on the shot being fired. This is called the shot line. The rope is fired to the sailors in peril, who can grab it and use it to haul in a sturdier rope called a whip line, which has two tail blocks on it. One of the tail blocks is anchored on the shore, and one is affixed to the vessel. By pulling the ropes in one direction or the other, they are able to send out life-saving equipment or haul in survivors ashore. The sailors on the stricken ship slowly began pulling in the shot line, while those on the shore did what little they could while they waited for the line to be secured. It took a full hour for the whip line to reach the vessel, all the while the men on the beach anxiously wondered why the ship was still fast to the bar and being battered by the sea instead of washing closer to the shore. After giving the men on the ship some time to get the line secured, the men on the beach began to pull on the whip line to begin hauling somebody ashore. But then something terrible happened, or rather, something didn't happen that should have. The line didn't move. They pulled violently on it, but nothing gave. The fact that the whip line didn't move startled them like a catastrophe, as their captain later wrote. It meant that they had now done almost all that they could, and the line was disabled. They stood there, helplessly unable to do anything, as the wind fell silent, and the ship took a sharp tilt to its starboard. Sprague tried shouting to those on the ship to clear the line. A shout was returned, but it was too faint to understand. By one in the morning, the full crew from the Beach Haven station and several from other life-saving stations had arrived, making up a total of 28 men on the beach, all worked together to try to pull in the whip line, but to no avail. Indeed, it really was stuck. By this time, the tide was mounting to full flood, and the surf had become horrible. Wind, wave, rain, and spray were all commingled in a vast and disorderly onset of tempest, deafening, blinding, drenching, battering in a tremendous darkness lit only by livid flashes from the breakers. The men were now wading into the freezing surf, desperately trying to free the line for the men on the ship. Some were swept off their feet and needed to be grabbed from being washed away. The men on the beach fell back once more, this time climbing up onto an old wreckage that had been beached on the shore a while back and was now acting as an island in the rising tide. Their only escape from here would be their own surf boat, but they chose to do this anyway in desperate hope that they may be able to at least pull a sailor from the water. At 3 a.m., the ship was heard breaking apart. Instead of coming ashore, the vessel rolled to starboard and dipped by the bow, sliding under a wave and disappearing. At that moment, the whip line anchored nearby snapped and shot out into the sea, being dragged by the tumbling wreckage. The men on the beach held their ground for another hour, hoping to spot someone swimming ashore, but nobody did. By dawn, as the tide receded, the beach was strewn with wreckage, and a strong smell of sugar from the ship's cargo lingered over the now silent beach. In the coming days, five bodies of the ship's eight crewmen washed ashore and were properly processed and buried nearby. The investigators combed over the wreckage and were able to answer both of the disaster's mysteries, 
why the whip line was stuck, and why the ship remained on the bar to be torn to pieces. Both were cases of tragic human error. When the ship, which was later identified as the Elmina, first struck the bar, her crew panicked and dropped her anchor. This held her in place, forcing her to fight a losing battle against the waves, instead of moving with them and pushing the stricken ship closer to shore for rescue or perhaps even freeing the ship and allowing it to safely resume on its course. This was determined to be the sole cause of the ship's wrecking. The whip line itself, which had an identifying piece of yarn woven through the rope, along with the block, were found on the beach shortly after and showed exactly why it didn't budge. Instead of the block being properly fixed and allowing it to function as a, as a pulley, the block was ignored and the line was simply tied around one of the yards in the rigging. It was a partial relief to the men of the life-saving stations along Long Beach Island that the death of the crew of the Elmina was not their fault, but it further saddened them to know that rescue was literally in the hands of those aboard the ship and destroyed voluntarily. It was believed that as the ship was slowly beginning to break apart, the Almina's crew felt that there simply wasn't enough time to wait for the rescuers on shore to haul survivors one by one off of the ship, and instead they fixed the line securely and tried to climb, shimmying ashore hand over hand. The men in the New Jersey life-saving stations were praised for having done everything right, including successfully landing three of the five shots across the ship in the dark. Despite having done everything right, there simply was nothing more that they could have done for the men of the Barkentine Almina. This ship has no memorial plaque. There are no articles or documentaries telling her story, and there's nothing to be googled. There is simply her registry, and the life-saving service report. While I'm sure that the events of this night haunted the men on the beach for the rest of their lives, the deaths of these eight British sailors was simply put into a four-page report, filed away, and that cabinet was closed.